What makes Washington DC unique? You may already know that Washington DC, that is the District of Columbia, was designed and planned on, on a map to be the capital of the United States of America. But did you know that Washington DC is filled with hidden, almost mysterious symbolism that only the initiated eye can truly see? Why is the Capitol, seat of the Congress of the United States, considered a temple of liberty? Why is the statue on top of that dome, freedom statue, facing east? Why is the monument to George Washington an Egyptian-styled obelisk? Allow me to take you on a journey to Washington, D.C. and help you uncover the hidden mysteries behind the design and architecture of the world's most powerful capital city. Hello, I'm Akram Elias and I'm speaking to you from the reading room of the first library to be open to the public in the city of Washington, the library of the House of the Temple of the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. It is almost impossible to fully understand how this city came to be without understanding the role that Freemasonry and prominent Freemasons played in the design and development of this nation's capital, including some of its most important symbols, such as the U.S. Capitol and the White House. In 1790, the Congress of the United States decided to establish a permanent capital for the United States. Every state wanted to have the nation's capital to settle the dispute. Members of Congress decided that there should be a neutral site that would not be a state and would not be part of any state. And so it was the District of Columbia, Columbia in honor of Christopher Columbus. And of course the word Washington as being the city in the District of Columbia was to honor George Washington. Now, the first president of the United States, George Washington, being chief executive, asked a French architect, an American, I should say, of French origin, his name was Pierre L'Enfant, to design the city. But George Washington put a very important condition on L'Enfant. He insisted that the District of Columbia be a square. Why a square? Why not a circle, a triangle, or any other form? Why a square? Well, you may think of certain expressions in English such as fair and square, a square deal, to be on the square, to act on the square. The idea being here that this new form of government was going to be on the square. In other words, it was going to operate differently from the old order, which was represented by the absolutist monarchy and its twisted ways of doing things. The new order that the founding fathers of the United States of America were establishing was going to operate with much more transparency, with participation by the people. People would know how policies would be formulated, things would be on the square. Now this concept of the square is very important. George Washington insisted on it because he, like many other founding fathers of the United States, were members of one of the world's most ancient fraternities, the Order of the Freemasons. And to Freemasons, the square is the symbol of the master of the lodge. It represents virtue and wisdom. So George Washington wanted to send a very powerful message that this new form of government should attempt to be virtuous in its actions. All the boundary stones of the District of Columbia were laid in full Masonic ceremony by the Freemasons of the area using corn, oil, and wine as symbols of prosperity, peace, and happiness. And George Washington himself insisted on laying the cornerstone of the United States Capitol. He led a parade down Pennsylvania Avenue wearing his Masonic regalia as a past master of Alexandria Masonic Lodge, all the way to the hill, Jenkins Hill, to lay the cornerstone of the most important and the most majestic building in the United States, the Capitol. In commemoration of that historic parade, President Thomas Jefferson insisted 
to travel down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol to be sworn in. And ever since, it has become a tradition in the United States for the president-elect to travel down Pennsylvania Avenue, go to the Capitol where he would be sworn in. The U.S. Capitol is considered a temple of liberty. It is situated on an east-west axis. This is in accordance with the ancient tradition. The ancients believed the sun was such an important god. It is a source of light. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So temples were positioned east-west. It is also made of marble, interestingly enough. Marble in architecture is a symbol of immortality. And that is to say, almost symbolically, that this temple of liberty is immortal. That is, liberty is immortal. And fascinatingly enough, it took approximately seven years to build the first capital, from 1793 to 1800. It was in 1793 that George Washington had laid that cornerstone in Masonic ritual, seven years. We find that number to be quite intriguing. For there are two other temples in the city. The Lincoln Memorial is considered a temple of democracy and magically it took also seven years to build from 1915 to 1922. It is of course situated east-west again in accordance with the tradition of the ancients having to do with the sun and it is made of marble and that is to say that democracy should be immortal. And the third temple is the Supreme Court of the United States which is also located on that hill. It took magically seven years to build made of marble, situated east-west. Very interesting, isn't it? On top of the dome of the United States Capitol is a statue of a woman. She represents freedom. But if you take a close look at it, you will see that she's facing away from the National Mall. And that's something that had bothered me, and I asked why, and I was given all kinds of answers, including one that maybe Pierre Lafay had intended or had in mind that the mall would go and Washington would expand in the other direction. But I found that to be nonsense. Yes, he had designs for the city to go in all four directions, but the mall as we know it today was definitely in his plan. Pennsylvania Avenue was drawn, the location of the White House was set. So it couldn't be that, it had to be something else. And then I discovered, of course, that the sculptor Thomas Crawford He's also a Freemason. Quite interesting, because as you look at the statue now, she's really facing east. East being the source of light. In Freemasonry, east is the source of light, because the sun rises in the east. So the idea here is that freedom is the result of enlightenment. So freedom faces east. Why is that important? Because Freemasonry teaches that a person can truly become free only when he or she is able to defeat the three enemies of the free mind. And those are ignorance, fanaticism, and tyranny. And those can only be defeated by the persons seeking more light, becoming enlightened through more knowledge to defeat them. The Lincoln Memorial is designed as a Greek temple. It should remind the, per the viewer of the Parthenon, the famous Greek temple on the Acropolis of Athens. Why is that? Simple. Henry Bacon, the architect, argued that only once in the history of the United States, democracy as a system was endangered. Of course, because of the fight over uh, slavery, which led to a secession and a terrible civil war from 1861 to 65. Lincoln, who was president, having won the war, abolished slavery, and kept the unity of the country, saved democracy. So his memorial is not a simple monument, it is a temple of democracy. And since we credit the ancient Greeks for having invented the concept of democracy, it is designed as a Greek temple and took magically seven years to build. This magical number seven, which we find behind the Temple of Democracy, the Lincoln Memorial, the Capitol Building, the Temple of Liberty, and the Supreme Court of the United States, a Temple of Justice. 
did not come out of thin air. Interestingly enough, we find that the Freemasons value much the number seven because the Temple of King Solomon, according to the Judeo-Christian tradition, was the first temple to be erected to the monotheistic God in that tradition. And according to the Bible, it took seven years to build. So magically, these three temples, each one of them, took seven years to build. Now, of course, number seven has powerful esoteric meanings. We look at the sun and we see the seven colors of the spectrum coming together to form white light. So number seven is very important when it comes to the natural order of the universe. As one enters the Lincoln Memorial, one sees the statue of Abraham Lincoln seated on a pedestal. Indeed, that pedestal is an altar. For Abraham Lincoln was assassinated at the end of the Civil War, and Daniel Chester, French sculptor, argued that Lincoln gave literally his life away for the sake of democracy. So he symbolically became the sacrificial lamb on the altar of democracy in the temple. Powerful symbolism, and that explains why Martin Luther King, back in the 60s, came in front of that memorial to give his most famous speech, I Have a Dream. And ever since, citizen groups, whenever they organize major protests, marches, they like to come in front of the Lincoln Memorial, the temple of democracy. But looking at the other end, they see the Capitol building on the other side of the mall, a temple of liberty. What better place between both temples, the temple of liberty and the temple of democracy, to hold such demonstrations and marches. There is something more intriguing about the statue of Abraham Lincoln and it has to do with yet another concept that is espoused by the teachings of the fraternity, not solely by the fraternity of the Freemasons. Many other esoteric groups also believe in that and that concept is that of the duality. That is, the natural order of the universe is based around a duality of forces that do appear to us as being opposite, but in reality they complement one another. Things such as darkness and light, male, female, night and day, positive, negative. Both are necessary for creation to take place, for life to go on. No one is better than the other. They do complement each other and only when they are in a state of equilibrium there is harmony in the universe. If one takes a close look now at the chair, one sees that the sides of the chair below his hands depict the ancient Roman symbol of power, one being the opposite of the other. The Romans used to say you may take a stick and break it, but if you take a group of sticks and group them together, you may not be able to, to break them. So there is strength in unity. One is the opposite of the other. Negative force and positive force are a state of equilibrium represented in that chair. This is to represent that Abraham Lincoln was a wise leader, for he was able to put at a state of equilibrium and use wisely. Negative force, the use of war to win the war, and positive force, compassion in order to win the peace. Wisdom lies in the ability of putting these two opposite forces at a state of equilibrium. The concept of the duality one can find on the back of the dollar bill. Now the one dollar bill is probably the most esoteric piece of paper money that exists today in the world. And by esoteric we mean it is filled with hidden mysterious symbols. Now, on the back of the one dollar bill one finds the great seal of the United States divided into two parts, a pyramid and an eagle. We are first going to talk about the eagle. We can talk about the pyramid later for it is connected to the Washington Monument. The eagle, according to the founding fathers of the United States, is a symbol of freedom and independence. It is the symbol of the new order because in the old order the eagle was the symbol of power, like the Roman eagle. 
Now you, may, you will notice that the eagle is holding on one side 13 arrows, the arrow being the symbol of war, that is negative force, 13 to reflect the number of the founding states. On the other side, the eagle is holding an olive branch, 13 leaves, again for the same reason, but the olive branch here representing peace, positive force. And the eagle is balancing both, putting them at a state of equilibrium. In its beak, it is holding a banner. On that banner is the motto of the United States in Latin, E Pluribus Unum, which means out of many, one. And that is to signify diversity within unity. So the meaning of this symbol is that the United States would remain free and independent as long as it kept its diversity within its unity and knew how to balance wisely between the use of negative force, war, and that of positive force, peace. But unlike the old order, where countries went to war to grab more land, to enslave other peoples, under the new order, the country should go to war only for the sake of building peace. And that is why the eagle is turned towards the olive branch. That requires a lot of wisdom and is not easy to do and that is why you see above the eagle the symbol of wisdom and that symbol also comes from the archives of the fraternity of the Freemasons. You find 13 stars arranged in the shape of a six-pointed star. Now if you ask any lay person what is a six-pointed star and of course you will hear Star of David. Indeed it is. However, it is the seal of King Solomon. King Solomon was the wise king according to the Bible. His seal is a symbol of wisdom. It is made up of two equilateral triangles. The equilateral triangle, meaning it is made up of three equal sides, to represent the nature of the human being. We are part matter, part intellect, and part spirit. And all three should be at a state of equilibrium for, to, for harmony to prevail within the human being. Now why two triangles? Because one points from earth to the heavens and the other one points down from the heavens to the earth. At a state of equilibrium they form the six-pointed star. A very important symbol in the order of the Freemasons. When I first visited Washington DC, I was truly intrigued by the fact that the monument to George Washington was an Egyptian styled obelisk. And I could not find the answer to why. So I went up about doing my own research, wanting to know what is the relationship, if any, what was the connection between George Washington and the ancient Egyptians. My research helped me discover something fascinating. And that is, most of the architects, the prominent architects who have worked on the city and worked on the most important monuments in the city, were members of the Masonic fraternity. Like James Hoban, architect of the White House, Bullfinch, Latrobe, and Walter, the three most important architects who worked on the Capitol building. Robert Mills, the architect of the Washington Monument, also a member of the fraternity. Something quite interesting about the city of Washington are the statues that one one finds almost everywhere. Of course, many of them are statues of uh, generals going back to the period of the Civil War, that is, northern generals, but of course, with one very important exception, a monument for the only southern general in the city of Washington, General Albert Pike, who happened to be the founder of the Scottish Rite in the United States. But in addition to monuments of prominent Americans, many of them of course were Freemasons. John Paul Jones is a good example, founder of the Navy in this country. Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers. One finds also monuments for prominent leaders from overseas who were Freemasons and worked very hard to establish the new order in their own respective countries. If you walk north of the White House, you find yourself at Lafayette Park. This park can be easily renamed Fraternity Park, for you find 
five statues in that park. One statue in each one of the four corners and a fifth statue in the center of the park. The one in the middle of the park is that of Andrew Jackson, the famous American general and later president of the United States, who was of course a prominent Freemason and happened to be Grand Master of his own Grand Lodge. As for the other four, Van Steuben from Prussia, Kochuska from Poland, Rochambeau, and the famous Lafayette, both from France. All four were also members of the Fraternity of the Freemasons. When one travels down Virginia Avenue, one finds monuments for prominent leaders from the Americas. Benito Juarez, Jose Artigas, Jose de San Martin, Simon Bolivar, four of the most important leaders who fought for establishing the new order in their respective countries and in the region, from Mexico to Bolivia to Ecuador, Chile, etc. Each one of them happens to be a member of the Masonic order. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president of the United States at a very difficult time in the 20th century, the Great Depression and World War II. He knew that people wanted him remembered, so he willed that if there to be any monument dedicated to him, that it should be a block made of stone, wood, or any other material, but no larger than the size of his desk, and to be prominently displayed in front of the National Archives which we see it where we see it today. However, people felt that his will having been respected, it was time now to do something else for him. So he's got a memorial that is a park in the open air with water and trees all over the place. And it's divided into four sections, each section representing a term in office. One very important aspect of the memorial is the use of stone. If you look carefully at the walls, you will see that each stone is truly unique in its size, shape, or color shading. This is to signify, symbolically, the concept of diversity within unity, the motto of the United States, a pluribus unum. That each one of us, no matter where we come from, what we believe in, what background we have, we can coexist peacefully with others while preserving our personal identity. So the concept of diversity within unity. The stone was very important to FDR and the architect of the memorial discovered that it was so, and especially granite. And one can never understand why stone was so important to FDR unless one understands that FDR was also a Freemason. Freemasonry teaches that the individual is like a, a rough ashlar, a rough stone with rough edges all around and that part of life of refining oneself or improving oneself through the arts of the craft is to smoothen the edges and become a smooth ashlar. Interestingly enough, when you look at what's happening in the memorial, especially when we go to section 3, the one that represent that represents World War II. You see the stones on the ground that are rough all around, representing war. They refuse to smoothen the edges, to peacefully coexist with others while preserving their identity, but they refuse to compromise around the edges so they can build next to, above, or below the others. So they fight the rough ashlar. A very important Masonic concept. But probably the most important thing in this memorial is what you see carved on the wall next to his statue. Out of all the sayings of FDR, this passage was selected to be next to his statue. Yet most people, including most Americans, have no clue where that came from. Almost every American remembers the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Yet this is not the sentence that was put next to his statue. Why was that passage selected? It has to do with the fact that FDR was responding to Adolf Hitler. Hitler was talking about establishing a new order, 
that would last hundreds if not thousands of years. But his new order had nothing to do with the new order that the founding fathers, many of whom were Masons, had conceived for the United States. So FDR felt obligated to defend that concept and explain that what they call new order is not new and it is not order. For the concept of a new world order was a concept designed, conceived by the founding fathers of the United States and dates back to 1783. Take a look at this Egyptian styled obelisk in the heart of the mall of Washington DC. This is the official monument of George Washington and it is yet the most intriguing of all the monuments in the city. Only the initiated person could really understand why why Washington's monument is an obelisk. Obelisks were dedicated by the ancient Egyptians to the sun god Ra. An obelisk represents a beam of light and to the ancient Egyptians the sun was a wonderful symbol of the natural order of the universe. The concept of diversity within unity, the diversity of the seven colors of the spectrum coming together to form white light. And so George Washington brought together 13 diverse colonies to form the United States of America. In a way, Robert Mills, by having an obelisk dedicated to George Washington, was not only honoring George Washington, but was also immortalizing in marble the motto of the United States, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. Now, why was the concept of an obelisk in the first place? One cannot understand that unless one realizes that the Founding Fathers of the United States considered themselves to be builders, builders of a new order, especially the Masons among them. And you may ask who among them were, to name a few. George Washington, of course, par excellence. James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, John Hancock, American revolutionaries like Paul Revere, etc., were members of that fraternity. They believed that they were establishing a new order, a new order based on three key principles of individual free will, that each human being is endowed by his or her creator with a free will, which includes freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of association, freedom of work. The rule of the people, that is people should have the right to govern themselves by themselves through representation. That there should no longer be a situation where someone could claim a divine right to rule in an absolutist fashion. And the rule of law, that there should be a written law that has the consent of the governed. And people would know that no one would be above the law. These are the three pillars of the New World Order they were talking about and dates back to 1783. So the founders adopted the pyramid and the obelisk as symbols of this New World Order to be built. We see the obelisk in the city of Washington dedicated to President George Washington because he was the builder par excellence. After all, remember, a free mason is a free builder, that is, a free thinker who is trying to build a better world. The pyramid you find, again, on the back of the one dollar bill. It is the other half of the Great Seal of the United States. And it is below the pyramid that one finds the Latin expression, Novus Ordo Seclorum, which means New Order for the Ages, or New World Order. One finds this also carved on the marble walls of the Senate's chamber in the United States Capitol building. Why the pyramid? It is in a way to state that this new world order is not easy to build. It is as difficult as building the pyramid. It takes time, energy, effort, knowledge. And very important about the pyramid, as you see, it is unfinished. For it is impossible to say 
that the building process is over. It is never over. In a democracy, the building continues constantly without an end, without reaching perfection, for perfection is only to the deity. Another very interesting thing about uh, the pyramid is the base, the first layer one sees in Roman numerals, the year 1776. This is again the founders reminding future generations of Americans that they, i.e. the founders, were simply laying the first layer that much building has to take place. And indeed, if you think about the history of the great experiment, it is in constant evolution. And every generation of Americans would have to participate, be active in it, to make sure that the building process continues. One last thing we can see above the pyramid is an eye. An eye within a triangle and light coming out of it. It's a mythological symbol representing the deity. And one may wonder, why did the founders adopt that? Well, it is to emphasize freedom of conscience. For if you're a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim, a monotheist, you can interpret that as the symbol of the omnipotent, omnipresent God, the source of light that sees everything. If you're a Buddhist, this could represent the source of inner light, this could be the third eye of wisdom that sees above the duality and puts things at a state of equilibrium and in harmony. It is to emphasize freedom of conscience. Another interesting thing about the Washington Monument has to do with its measurements. It is 555 feet in height and 55 feet by 55 feet at the base. All fives. I wonder why. Why number five? Interestingly enough, isn't there a pentagon in the Washington metropolitan area? Five-sided building. The American star is a five-sided star, five-pointed star. Why number five? Now, it is difficult to, uh, to really get to the bottom of this unless one, once again, refers to the secret, mysterious teachings of the symbols of the fraternity. Number five is the number of the fellow craft. This is the person who is actually building. The Freemason is taught to seek knowledge in the arts and sciences, to develop those skills, so he, he or she can go and build a better self, a better family, and a better community. It is the symbol of the builder. George Washington was the builder of a new nation, so his monument has fives written all over it. The United States was a builder of a new experiment, a new order. So the star of America is a five-pointed star. And the Pentagon happens by coincidence to be a five-sided building. Maybe it is to say that this country should not be going to war in order to expand to enslave other people, as it used to be done under the old order. But it should go to war only for building the peace and the new order. Another intriguing fact about the city of Washington has to do with the location of the Jefferson Memorial. Part of the Potomac River had to be reclaimed. About six years of work was done to position the Jefferson Memorial where it is across from the White House. It was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a Freemason, who commissioned the work of the building of the memorial of Thomas Jefferson. And interestingly enough, the question has to do with why that location. A closer look at the heart of Washington, D.C. shows us that there is really a rectangle going in that direction, if we were to continue down the river this way, past the Lincoln Memorial, all the way here, going up by the White House, straight all the way here, then coming back to the Capitol. This rectangle is positioned east-west. In the east is the Capitol. In the west is the Lincoln Memorial. In the south is the Jefferson Memorial. And in the north is the White House. 
This rectangle is pointing east-west. It is designed as if it were a large room. Lodges are positioned east-west. And in the east is the position of the master of the lodge, that is the source of light and wisdom. And in this case, talking about the system of government in this country and of course the building of Washington DC, the capital is in the east. That is the source of light, of freedom and democracy in this great experiment comes from the legislative branch, the Congress of the United States. Now interestingly enough, the Lincoln Memorial is in the west. And the positioning here has to do with, again, the movement of the sun. The sun rises in the east, sets in the west, and the cycle of light continues. Abraham Lincoln, having saved democracy as an order, as a system in this country, the cycle of freedom and democracy has continued in this country. So it makes sense to have the Lincoln Memorial positioned in the west. The Jefferson Memorial becomes in the south. Now, at meridian, at noon, the sun is in the south. It is high up, as if Jefferson is standing above the city, watching over the city, making sure that everything is fine. He's the one who drafted the Declaration of Independence of the United States and enunciated those very important ideals and principles upon which the system was founded, as if he's watching over the city, making sure those ideals and principles are being respected. And finally, the White House is right here in the north. Now that northern location is very important. In a Masonic Lodge, this is where the candidate for initiation is placed. Why? Because this is considered the place of darkness the North. Where did this come from? It came from the ancients. Again, it has to do with the ancients around the Mediterranean region. The people there saw the sun rise in the east, set in the west, and at noon be in the south. They could not see it in the north. So esoterically they deemed the north as the place of darkness. And in those ancient ceremonies, any candidate for initiation in the secret societies of the times would be positioned in the northern part of the room and the person would travel in his initiation to the east to get the light. That's part of the initiation. And interestingly enough, that's what happened in a Masonic Lodge. So if we look carefully now at the positioning of the White House vis-a-vis -vis the Capitol, and this is Pennsylvania Avenue, we know that the president-elect leaves the White House, travels down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol where he is sworn in, as if he's getting initiated to get the light from there. This is to remind the President that he is not the Sun King. He's not the one who knows it all. He is like a candidate to be initiated. And it is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court that administers the oath to remind the President that this is what the Constitution says. This is done according to the law. Another interesting fact about the rectangle is that we have two avenues here that cut across the mall. This is Independence Avenue and this is Constitution Avenue. The only two avenues in the city that are truly parallel to each other and they cut this rectangle east-west as if there were two columns, very important concept in masonry, the two columns. And lastly, a closer aerial view of the city of Washington shows something fascinating that was completed by locating the Jefferson Memorial where it is. One can see clearly from the Capitol Pennsylvania Avenue going all the way to the White House. And again from the Capitol, if one takes Maryland Avenue and keeps extending it all the way to the Jefferson Memorial, you have the compasses. And then from the White House to the Lincoln Memorial, and from the Lincoln Memorial to the Jefferson, is the square. 
the square and the compasses, the universal symbol of Freemasonry. And a last fascinating point about this, right here we see the monument for George Washington. And if one were to color it right now and just give you the color black to make it fit with the rest, and you put the letter G right here at the base of the Washington Monument, you end up having right here the position of the G, the great geometer. G is the symbol for the deity. And the universal symbol of Freemasonry in the United States is thus complete. George Washington is remembered in Washington, D.C. as a general and a president. As a general, he set an extraordinary precedent in this country. Having won the War of Independence, the people, many among them, wanted him to be king. George Washington is often referred to as the man who would be king. He not only refused to be king, but more importantly, he ordered the soldiers to return to their homes. He resigned his commission as general and told the soldiers to obey the civilian authority. And for six years, from 1783 to 1789, not a single coup in this country, all because of George Washington and what he did. He was a simple man. He never let power get to his head. He was later elected president of the United States, elected to a second term, and when people wanted him re-elected to a third term, he said no. He almost told people, learn to elect someone else. Much in this country is owed to George Washington. George Washington, founder of the, of the United States, first in war, first in peace, and a great Freemason. Next time you visit Washington, D.C., seek out those hidden symbols. I guarantee you, your experience will be much richer. Oh, and by the way, next time you sing or hear the word song of the Star Spangled Banner, do remember that Francis Scott Key, the author, was also a Freemason.